In this episode of Conducting Build, we'll go into an analysis of that masterpiece of symphonic music that is the overture to Mozart's magic flute. Hi, I'm Giamatta Grillo, I'm a conductor and a composer, and welcome to this new episode of Conducting Builds, a series where we look into a classical piece or a part of it and outline its structure and phrasing, orchestration and harmony, with the bonus technical tips for conductors. I want to take a second to thank my new patron Justin White, and to remind you that on my Patreon page you can find the full episodes of Conducting Pills and the extra episodes tackling technical aspects on top of the live sessions and many other patrons' works. And now, let's begin! Undoubtedly one of the most beloved opera of all times, the Zauber Flute, the Magic Flute, was the product of a collaboration between Mozart and Emmanuel Schikaneder. Schikaneder was an impresario, a dramatist, an actor, a singer, and a composer. But, above all, in this context, he was to Mozart a fellow mason. Schikaneder brought in a much-needed commission for a new fairy tale opera for his theatre, the Theater auf der Wieden. The premiere took place on September 30, 1791, just a couple of months short of Mozart's death. Those who sat in the theater during the premiere must have noticed the drawing decorating the first page of the libretto, a drawing by Ignaz Alberti, editor of the libretto and Mason brother of Mozart. To many, it might have seemed a simple representation of an archaeological site in Egypt, but the allusion to the Mason were not lost to some. The path from dark to light, the star in the middle, a trowel in the front. There are plenty of books on the subject. One I find particularly interesting is Mozart's The Mason by Anna Manfredini, published by Los Carabeo Libri in 1991. Structure-wise, we have a sonata form with a slow introduction followed by an allegro divided into the canonical sections of exposition, development, recapitulation, and coda. There are a couple of deviations from the standard sonata form structure, which we'll see later. The masonry connection is evident right from the overture. The number three, recurring throughout the rituals and the characters, appears right in the key of E flat and in the repetition of the three initial chords. This old introduction is real paced but not heavy despite the constant presence of the trombones. Nothing like the drama we witnessed in the overture of Don Giovanni, which by the way you can find right here. We then proceed in steps in our initiation journey that will take us from darkness to light. Two bars plus two bars a step higher. Two bars of up and down, and notice the harmonic subtlety in bars 10 11 with that G flat and A natural. And four bars to bridge to the allegro. Notice the syncopation in the trombones. Here's the first deviation, so to speak, from the regular sonata form. The theme is presented in the fugato fashion. Four bars in the second violins on E flat. Look at how the basic cell of one bar moves up a fifth in the second bar. The transition from the adagio to the allegro can be quite challenging, unless, like with everything, you know the trick behind it. Stop your stroke on the last beat of bar 15. This will give you just enough time to give an upbeat in the new tempo. The allegro, keep your gestures small and from the wrist. The same four bars are repeated by the first violins starting on the dominant, the B flat, and then moved up of a four to the E flat. Notice the syncopation in the second violin on bar 22. It will become a very important element later on. Three bars of bridge, and the theme is exposed by the bassoons, violas, and cellos again in E flat with the violins in counterpoint. Take note of the first violin's descending scale, we will see much of it later on. Two final bridging bars take us to the first forte. That is, that there is no crescendo. Look at how the phrase is constructed starting on bar 39. Only the first two bars of the theme are used, while underneath we find the descending scale I mentioned earlier. Two bars and the rolls are inverted. The theme goes to the lower register and the scale to the higher. And notice how the trombones have whole notes in bars 41 42, stretching the half notes of the previous two bars and creating a subtle though higher contrast with the following bars. That syncopation we encountered earlier is back in full force in the bass line and moves to a higher register, four bars later landing in a modulating bridge. The 
Traditionally, we're moving to the key of B flat, the dominant, and we expect a second theme in contrast with the first one, but this doesn't quite happen. A couple of ninth chords introduce a certain uncertainty, and we need a progression of another six bars and three repetitions of two bars model to get to a clear B flat major. But then again, this does not really sound like a second theme. The main cell of the theme is there, bouncing back and forth between bassoons and clarinets. Is this now a counterpoint to the oboe and flute line, or is it the other way around? Moreover, we're taken to the forte, after only four bars where the full orchestra plays the main cell and the second patience. <laughs> is repeated and we get to the coda of the exposition. At this point we would expect a repetition of the exposition perhaps. Instead, Mozart gives us the first three chords of the introduction again, this time in B-flat without the strings and the timpani and with the repetition of each half note. The following allegro is the development part of this overture. Naturally we start with a theme in B-flat minor this time, underneath our descending scale. The cellos answer with a slight change. The G-flat turns into a G-natural, moving towards the key of C minor, then the voices start to tail one another. The descending scale in the bassoons, oboe and flute, while the theme underneath is part of progression in fifths landing on a G minor in bar 170. After one full bar rest, the development continues. The theme is shortened and enriched with a contrasting forte piano answered by the flute bassoon combination playing off the material in the would be second theme section of the exposition. This four bars model is repeated four times and will land on the E flat for the recapitulation. Except that it's different. The bassoons counterpoint immediately with the descending scale, and the cellos and basses highlight the harmony. The theme is reduced to two bars, and the parts overlap each other in a tight dovetailing that lands on the font. The repetition proceeds as usual. Mozart makes some changes in the coda. Look at the powerful horns, trumpets, and timpani in bar 211 and following. And note this fourth out of the trombones in 219 to 221. <laughs> Thank you for watching, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button right below the video and ring the bell so you will get notified every time a new video comes out. If you want to support the show monetarily, you can do so on my Patreon page and if you're interested in conducting technique, follow my Facebook group, all the links are in the description. Let me know in the comments what you think about this piece and if you have any suggestions for future videos and I look forward to seeing you next week with a new episode of Conducting Pills when we will start looking at Ravel's Mamerwa. In the meanwhile, please continue to enjoy music and be well. Point is the syncopations in the violins and violas in bar 4 and following, and in the clarinets, horns, and trombones in bars 13, 14, Four, which we are later. This will allow you enough time to give a clear upbeat in the new tempo. <laughs>